All right, good, good, good. Um, once again, connecting with your health through what I call move, think, and eat to live well. In the end, we all want to live well. We all want to live with more joy and more vitality. Um, in this discussion, uh, I organize it in that way that uh, I have a few questions prepared here, which I will ask. And then, um, in the end, I will also pass uh, over to the audience uh, to throw in one or two questions. So along the line, if you do have some question in mind, you can just uh, put it down so that uh, you won't forget it. All right. Um, being that uh, Kingsley over here is someone that I know very well, I am having a feeling that I should get started with you. <laughs> oh, please. <laughs> okay, cool. But anyway, yes, um, when we think about uh, well-being, obviously, uh, we cannot uh, take out the importance of physical fitness and its uh, contribution to our overall well-being. So um, just to get started, Kingsley, um, what do you think, um, basically, how does the body benefit from fitness exercise, just to get started, to open the conversation? Okay, so um, first of all, I just want to thank you, Everise, for this great event and uh, the rest of Think Africa team. Um, it's a great pleasure to be with you all today. Um, this is, for me, an interesting topic, uh, partly because it's something that I'm, I am really, really intrinsically drawn to. Um, if you look at um, everything around us, when you think about technology, the habit that is changing, the culture that is changing, everything that makes us um, strong, not just physically but mentally, we are just, you know, drifting away from everything like that. Um, and, and that's the trend. So if you think, at, you think about... Um, the modern society where, you know, you can just sit at your home just with a screw with, a screw with your phone. Your food can even just come, come to you. So um, the time to have this kind of discussion can never be better than now. Because once we know better, uh, I believe we do better. And that's how human beings have evolved and get to this stage where we are today. But it's also cru crucially important to actually take, you know, sometimes step, take, take a step back to look at, you know, um, what it is that actually help your life if no one else is actually talking about it or actually giving you an information that you need. So, uh, just to uh, touch a bit to your question. So, um, when you think about fitness, right, there's so uh, there's just a lot that I can say that actually benefits us when you engage in physical activities. So it can be anything from you know increasing your mobility, where you can be able to you know feel your body, you can move, you can jump, you can run, you can do a lot of stuff. And even scientifically, if you think about you know uh, the fact that by the age of 65, basically, if you don't use, or if you're don't, if you not engaged in active sort of physical activities, by the time you get to the age of 60, 65, you will lose 80% of your strength and your muscle capability. Just think about that. That itself alone will tell you that you need to engage, you need to continuously you know, uh, engage in those activities that help your body to revitalize your body, to give you the strength that you need to, you know, to perform your day-to-day -day activities. Now, physical activities, it strengthens your mental sort of uh, flow. So it gives you clarity in terms of thinking, in terms of, 
you know, how you, how you respond to things around you, both physically and emotionally. So there's just a whole lot of, you know, different aspects of, you know, um, importance or, if you like, advantage of even of, of engaging in physical fitness. And I will encourage anyone, it's not, um, it's not about reps, it's not about push-ups, it's not about how many, you know, kilometers that you can run. You know, it's, it's, it's life. So, um, in, that, in, in that, I'm just saying that there is nothing that is more important than someone who is living both uh, mentally, physically, emotionally responding to everything that is around himself or herself. So it is crucially important that we find a way to engage in these physical activities. Thank you very much, Kinsley. Um, somehow I can relate to what you're saying from the perspective that sometimes we do have uh, what I call the the caution that I don't need uh, fitness, I don't need to go gym, I don't need muscle, but uh, from the view that you've uh, explained from, it's a lifestyle that every little bit of engagement in sport or physical activity is a kind of uh, self-contributing uh, value towards your future. Because when you grow old, the older you become, you find out that uh, you start to feel the energy that you used to feel when you were very young. But you mentioned something very interesting, and you said it also uh, affects the mental well-being. And I will throw my next question to Esther, just to kind of uh, broaden this conversation to the area of uh, mental well-being. Uh, what do you think? What is mental well-being to give us a bit more what I would call agreeable definition to guide the discussion. Yes, uh, thank you for the question. It's really nice to be here. And I am actually very happy that when this uh, event is organized and when you are talking about mental, uh, about well-being, mental health is also coming up. Because I think when we are talking about health, usually we talk about, you know, exactly like only from the physical point of view, though it's really much connected together if you think about when you cry or when you laugh Ex like that's exactly like an emotion coming out in a physical way so they are very much connected and um, at Mieli we used to say that there is no health without mental health so it's really great to be here and uh, talk about this part of health um, coming back to the definition point of view um, I can give you a very <laughs> exact definition that um, was created by uh, WHO and it says and actually it's I, I first didn't like it but I think by now it's a really good one so it's that it says that mental health is a state of well-being when a person can contribute to the community work productively cope with the everyday stress of life um, and the last one is my favorite, can realize its own potential and act upon it, right? Because the first three is about just doing everyday stuff, like I work, I have maybe family, friends, I can cope with the stress, which are all very important. But it's more than that. It's also building something. It's also growing as a person. It's also challenging ours and looking for challenges. And it needs a lot of energy. It needs a lot of uh, mental capacity to do that. So mental health is definitely not just going to work, going home, and like doing everyday life. That's, that's very important, but also to go further, like have humor and optimism in the everydays. Like, finding a meaning in the life, being loved and uh, accepting love and looking for love, e uh, expressing emotions. Uh, so those are all included in mental health. And uh, yes. Um, I really liked uh, the view that you've shared that uh, especially being open to society because often uh, we take a very, what I call the singular view of ourselves. <laughs> that when we talk about mental health, we think that it's just about us. 
sometimes uh, society functions better when you have people who are mentally stable also, like who are able to make uh, impact that influence the whole general society. So I like that aspect of it. But also you said something about you know, being able to accept love and also willing to give love. It's uh, very interesting. But then I push my question further to um, Ella and uh, Jasmine uh, as the conversation look at the notion of well-being from these uh, three uh, different uh, dimensions. Food is one thing that is very important uh, to human uh, existence. Uh, so when we talk about uh, well-being, uh, from the nutritional perspective, from the food that we consume, how does food promote health? Okay, I can start with this one. So, um, we know that calories are food, and food is our fuel. But what are actually calories? So, uh, calories include macronutrients, uh, can you put the mic a bit oh, closer? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, vitamins and fiber, and proteins would be, for example, lentils, um, chicken, eggs, um, meat, and we proteins are very much needed for our skin to reduce muscle loss, um, to maintain our normal weight, and then we have carbs that are. Um, potatoes, uh, rice, um, bread, and carbs are needed for our brain, for example. Um, it's main source of energy for our body. And also there has been studies that lack of carbs can increase um, stress hormones. Then we have fats, and fats we need for fat-soluble vitamins also for our hormones and to our healthier cells. And good fats would be oils, seeds, nuts, fish, for example. And the, here we have the macronutrients. So let's look a little bit closer to fiber and also the micronutrients. First, fiber. Where can you get fiber? Um, basically, fiber is included in carbohydrates. And there are certain foods which are higher in fiber. For instance, wheat, bran, oats, rye, and then certain fruits. Fiber, first of all, it helps with the bowel movement. Uh, if you have high fiber um, diet, then you are much less likely to have a colorectal cancer, for instance. Fiber also makes you feel full, so it helps you maintain healthy weight. It helps you control blood sugar, so it's less likely to get type 2 diabetes. And then also, um, fiber is food for the good gut bacteria. Then, when we're thinking about the vitamins and minerals, every single vitamin and mineral have their own function in the body. Let's take some examples. For instance, vitamin C helps to fight against the free radicals. Vitamin B12 helps to uh, maintain healthy uh, nervous system. And then uh, vitamin D, it helps with uh, absorption of calcium. Then we have zinc, which actually helps with the production of DNA. So these are like huge things ready from the nutrients you're getting, the benefits for the health. Okay. Um, that's very interesting and uh, because of uh uh, first of all, thank you for the response. I just want to quickly throw in another question to you. And that is, uh, one of the struggles that uh, people normally have in society is that, uh, you know, we have this trend of different diets. They will say, oh, such a diet is what is working. Oh, no, it's no longer that one, it's another diet, you know. So if we look at it from this perspective that uh, what is good for one person might not be good for another person. So how do we kind of come to this uh, idea of suitable diets? What is, uh, like how do we work at suitable diets to people? Yeah, um, I would start with the basics. 
So first, um, choose what kind of schedule works for you. Some people prefer to eat three times a day, some people five. Um, like, we are all different. You just have to find your way. Then after that, I would I could check my meals, that I do have all those macronutrients, for example, also vegetables and fruits. And so I get all these um, macros that I need for my body, because all of those have their job. And then I would check that I drink enough of water and start to build from there step by step. Uh, lately, people have started to avoid many things, for example, bread or gluten. And usually the reason is that they feel bloated. But actually, um, if you feel bloated, the reason might be something else. So I would check that I am active, so I will move. And then after that, I would check, okay, am I um, eating something unnecessary? But um, yeah, sh the, that shouldn't be like the first step to check that I'm gonna avoid something. And then as Ella said, I mean, this is a very, very important point that usually in these diets, for instance, let's say keto diet, uh, you completely, um, or not completely, but you decrease the amount of carbs. But as we said earlier, there is always like every single macronutrient and micronutrient have their own job. So have versatile diet, eat basically everything. But if you see that, for instance, wheat is not that good for you, eat a little bit less, but do not just avoid all the carbs because you need these carbs. Uh, for instance, Ella said that it lowers the level of cortisol. This is a stress hormone. So this is already like one factor why to need carbs and also um, also the um, uh, fact that brain needs it for the fuel. Also be conscious about the eating, like uh, think about like how do I feel about it, uh, what works for me, as Ella also said, and think about eating whole foods, nutrient-dense foods. I think that's quite, uh, those are good, quite uh, like good bases for, for to go. Thank you very much for the response. Um, and I really like it from that perspective that uh, even though we have a big pool of food to choose from, in the end of the day, uh, each one has to create its own plate. And you create that plate based on what your body identifies with the most and what is good for your, uh, what I would call <laughs> digestive system because these days uh, you, people eat different kinds of food and then they realize they have some kind of reaction or the body doesn't integrate the food properly into their system. But I'll move on with my next question to Esther. Um, one of the things about, uh, uh, or rather one of the struggles that people have with mental health is that uh, they don't often realize that they do struggle from uh, mental health. So how can someone find out that he's having a struggle with mental health issues? Well, it's uh, not an easy question, um, but I would actually reach back to the definition of mental health that um, I just mentioned, because, well, from clinical point of view, we, say, we talk about mental illness if you are not capable of maintaining your everyday life. So you can't go to work, you can't work with the kids or whatever. So that's, that's the baseline where you definitely need help. But that's, I guess, already pretty obvious for many of us. But then for many of us, maybe it's not. So depression, for example, can be that the person cannot get out of bed or cannot get there for the kids. And then people might think, oh, he's just bored, he's lazy or whatever, but it's important that it's not always that. So if someone is like that, then it most likely needs help. So if someone cannot maintain the everyday life, that's already like a reason to ask for help and that's completely fine. And then I would step a bit more above and what I just mentioned earlier that like, I think there is that level of life when you are maintaining your life, you're getting out of bed, you work, you get home, you take care of the kids, you do everything. But then 
you don't have personal goals, you don't have your personal time, you don't have possibility and energy to grow as a person. And I think then again, you should think about it. Okay, obviously we all have those um, like parts of our, our lives, but like if it's a long time, then it's maybe worth to think about it. Like if everything is all right. So I, I would definitely say that when you have the energy to look for something new, to be curious, that's, that's where you should be. If you are under that for a longer time, I think then it's time to think about like, okay, like maybe you should just talk, like have more time for yourself or talk more with your friends about your problems. But it's also very okay to ask a professional to talk about and figure out what's wrong because at the end of the day, you could have a really good quality life. So why would you settle for something less? Interesting. Um, one of the popular notions to that uh, response is uh, what I think they call, uh, what was this, uh, midlife crisis or something like that. You know, you come to a stage <laughs> where you want to advance and expand, but then you just don't know how to go about it. And you start rumbling around in your head, trying to figure things out to move to the next stage, but it doesn't quite come around. And, you know, so that can be like one of the a sign of a kind of a, you know, someone suffering from a sort of a mental challenge or? Definitely, and then of course there are, okay, so from, from psychology point of view, there are normative crises in life. For example, midlife crisis, or for example, me moving to a new country was definitely yes. a, a, like a, a crisis <laughs> for me. And like, I think it's maybe for the most of us. So there are the situational crises, which are n a natural point when you stop and think about, okay, where am I with my life and how do I want to redirect? But we can also take this crisis as an opportunity to stop for a second and think about, okay, I have been come this far, where can I go further? Mm -hmm. And then of course there can be unexpected crises like, um, like some accidents or a divorce or some sickness or something. That's again something else. But then again, I think when we define when you should notice when something is wrong is then when you can't fully you, don't, you can't feel and function in a way that you would like to. And it can be completely normal. And I actually very like your intro, uh, introducing speech because I do think that sometimes crisis is okay and sometimes bad feelings are okay and sometimes that's how you should feel. And then it's really okay to share it with others that, okay, I'm going through something. I have, I'm having a midlife crisis. I'm, I'm just a new immigrant here and I'm completely lost. And then, you know, when you reach out, you talk with others then it, it can, you can pass it through on your own. Thank you very much. Um, you know, <laughs> I think being an immigrant myself, I can tell that uh, some of the crises that I have to put up with is very mentally challenging. <laughs> but yes, uh, I move on. Um, you know, somehow, you know, having all this crisis and I'm starting to think, how do I figure things out? How do I manage this crisis and all that? Um, my next question to Kingsley is, uh, in the fitness world, uh, there is what they talk, for example, that, okay, how people should train to achieve, uh, like, a, a fitness goal, like, to reach a level of being fit. So, how should one train, for example, uh, to reach uh, fitness, to reach their physical fitness? Uh, it could be, for example, what they call this... Uh, endurance, uh, strength, and balance, and flexibility, because how can I train to achieve, for example, or what should I do to achieve maybe endurance or strength, to feel strength inside of me? Yeah, this is a very, there's a whole lot of things that goes into this, and there is no one specific definition to say, this is how you do it, this is what you must do. So there's a lot of theories around it, but for me, I like to keep everything basic, like just very basic. When I look, up, look back to where I came from, the genetics, you know, the way people live, where I came from, food is essential. You just eat what is good, healthy. Healthy food means, um, you know, eating something that has some nutritional value, right? And shy away, just keep it clean. Eat clean, eat functional, just eat to function. And if you put something bad in your body, no one will tell you. You will know it. 
right? So, of course, as much as I agree with science, um, I like to do a lot of experimentation. So, um, you know, if you want to keep uh, uh, fit uh, through exercise, I think it's a combination of, you know, cardio exercise, you know, cardiovascular exercises, um, endurance exercises, and a little bit also of, you know, weight training because you need to keep your muscles strong. You need to make sure that the muscle is able to retain, it's able to function, and the only way you can keep that consistency is actually from time to time try to lift something. You know, you lift some weight and that, that sort of thing. So I think I'll leave it at that. <laughs> well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I just wanted to say that uh, uh, both uh, Jasmine and uh, Ella, I know you both have a very good, solid background in uh, fitness as well. So if you have something that you want to throw in, you are free to also just quickly uh, uh, ship in. But I want to uh, redirect another question to Kingsley. Uh, I just, uh, I feel that, you know, this might kind of bring the discussion to more, to make it more personal. Uh, let's say, for example, I realize that I have, uh, I am weighing 85 kilos, and my fitness target is to reduce that to 75. What and what should I do to achieve that goal? Yeah, that's another very important question, and at the same time, very massive. Yeah, it could uh, be the basic, like what I, like I'm a novice right now. I just want to see how I achieve that goal. So basically, um, this, I think crucially, I would look at three elements to this. If someone come up to me and say, hey, you know, I'm carrying around 10 kilo SS of weight, and I want to get rid of it. So there are three things I will consider. Because if we go through all the different aspects and the different elements of how we should go about it, you know, we can't just, you know, um, 45 minutes wouldn't be enough to unfold this. So the three most uh, crucial sort of uh, element that I would think about is time. Um, I will consider time. I will um, look at, um, you know, consistency and sustainability. So th these three aspects. So time and meaning, if you come up to me to say you want to get rid of 10, kilo, 10 kilos of SS weight, so I would, first of all, I evaluate how much time you have to, to do that. So making sure that we set a realistic time. And in order for me to do that, um, there has to be a lot of discussion around you know, your current physical weight, your attitude to food, your, attitude, your you know, uh, response to physical activities and all of that. So that will actually give me some kind of understanding of how to actually you know, look at the program and then you know, set something. And then of course, when I talk about sustainability, I'm also looking at you know, the specifics in terms of the, the, the exercises and again, food. So when we talk about physical activities or being fit or being physically sound, it's not just the physical exercise. It's not just about lifting weight. It's not about just running and doing all, all of that kind of thing. Food is the most relevant aspect of it. And you can't take that out from the equation. So you eat clean. Me personally, I'm not shy of food, so meaning I eat. But when I eat, I'm aware of what I'm putting into my body. I'm aware of what I'm eating. But most importantly, I look at the nutritional values of things that I'm eating. And that's what has sustained me. And that is how I, what I will actually recommend to anyone. Eat clean. Uh, and when they talk, okay, let me, about something that is unhealthy. So food that is not healthy. Let me just define it in a simple terms, okay? So uh, oversaturated food. Uh, I mean, over processed food um, with preservatives, um, excess sugar. These are unhealthy set of food. And typical example of that is, you know, the, the burgers that you have around, the fast food joints. These are not something, you know, these are unhealthy stuff. I don't say, my theory is that you can have it, but please don't make that as, you know, a habit, okay? So if you look at the, the content of those food, you have over, like overprocessed bread, meat, 
uh, colorants, you know, French fries, you know, all these, all these things are just element of, you know, the nutritional value is almost zero. So why should you, I mean, don't do it, right? When I saw the KFC that just came on and people are just lining up and, you know, showing that on their Instagram and stuff like that and everyone is happy and I'm sure, and I'm like, wow, this is interesting. Because I'm not doing that and I will never do that because it has no nutritional value to my life, to my way of functioning and that sort of thing. Now, l let me talk about the, the, the sustainability aspect of this. So meaning that whatever f physical exercise that I introduce to whoever that want to get rid of excess kilos, I want to make sure that uh, it's consistent. So meaning that it's something that you can manage over time. So when you get rid of 10 kilo, how do you like maintain that? So uh, the sustainability, because obviously if you make a plan, an exercise plan that is too vigorous, that is too difficult, there is chance that someone will not be able to you know, stick to that over time. But if you make it a little bit easy with time, the body will adapt to it, it will register in the head, and then it becomes a habit. So that's how my approach looks like. It's basic, it's very simple, and I like it that way. Good. <laughs> so a little simple step forward to create a habit that eventually uh, promotes you, or uh, basically help you achieve that goal of uh, maybe weight reduction. Let's put it that way. Um, that's interesting. Um, now I throw over my question to Ella and Jasmine. Um, one of the very notion about food these days, when we talk about eating to promote our well-being, is that there are quite a lot of food supplements. And I'm not talking about supplements like that are vital, uh, like vitamin Ds and uh, vitamin B and those ones, but there are other kinds of supplements everywhere. And also, there are all kinds of, um, uh, not because that they are processed food, but uh, how can I put it, like, promote food that have been promoted to be very healthy options. So uh, in this context of uh, what I uh, call the, uh, what is the word again, supplements, how can one navigate all of this to actually identify with what I call real food that are good, that are healthy? So uh, basically you mentioned the vitamins and... Um of course, let's think about the supplements, like we have the vitamins which you're taking as a pill, and um, if you eat nutrient-dense foods, you do not, in most cases, need any kind of vitamin supplements. Uh, of course, vitamin D, that's an exception, especially here in Finland, when it's a very dark, for almost six months in a year, everyone should basically take vitamin D. Um, but other than that, or if you have like iron deficiency or some kind of uh, vitamin deficiency, that's a whole nother story. But when we're thinking, I guess that you meant uh, like um, whey protein and all, all these kind yes. of things. Yes. So um, since uh, the supplements are not medicine, they are not regulated almost in any way. There was actually a very Im interesting uh, article in Ule, like maybe one week ago, about the supplements, and they dig really deep into this topic. First of all, there is no strong scientific evidence for um, basically any kind of benefit from supplements, except five um, supplements, which are creatine, nitrate, beta-alanine, caffeine, and baking soda. These five have been researched a lot, and um, these ones actually work. But other than this, um, because there's no regulation, there were like um, athletes who had been taking uh, within a week, basically they took like from 15 up to 20 different supplements and um, they were interviewed in this article. So uh, they said that, yeah, but I trust because it's Finnish or it's like, you know, uh, made in Finland, but many of the ingredient list they don't tell you the, uh, the starting place of the ingredients. Plus, there were carcinogenic ingredients and also mold found in the supplements in Finland. 
I'm not trying to like scare people off about supplements, but the thing is that it's really good to understand that also the nutrients, all of them, also protein, all the macronutrients, they are getting better absorbed by your body from the real food. So maybe we'll throw it, it's better to eat a protein bar than go to KFC. <laughs> but uh, the thing is that, like, think about the quantity. So how much you eat of this? Like, if you eat one or two protein bars in a week, it's okay. But if you eat several every single day, if you uh, take whey protein every day, um, and let's not just think about whey because it's not the only thing, but like, in general, about the supplements, you can take a little, but think about it. Like, also, uh, you have to... Uh, take into consideration that there are um, flavorings, like artificial flavorings, like acetylpalm K and, um, and circulars and all that, and aspartame. So if you put this in your body um, every single day, that will also have effects in the long run. So, yeah. Thank you very much to that response. Um, this question, and I like the way you answered it because uh, my intention or personal intention for that is actually to clarify that sometimes uh, our quest and need to be fit, to maintain a healthy lifestyle might push us to what is being projected to us, being promoted to us. And because we lack you know, the in-depth understanding of what actually is inside of the product that are being sold, we buy it with the good faith that, oh, this is good for my health. And this become a big trap. And one of the things that I also experience when I go to gym is that there are quite a lot of people with their protein shake and all kinds of protein, you know, that they take with them. And uh, somehow I kind of like wonder, like, is gym becoming a culture where supplement is part of it, you know? Uh, we are slowly kind of like forgetting what it means, what, what's actually food. Food starts with being, it being natural. That's what food is. The understanding of processed food that we see today came as a result of marketing, and sometimes we cannot distinguish this in a general society when we look at things. But thank you very much for that response. So please, uh, when you go to gym and you are looking for ways to maximize your energy, don't just go jumping into some you know, protein to feel better. But I'll, I'll continue with my questions, and uh, this one goes to Esther. Uh, I know you that you work in uh, Mieli, which is the Mental Institute of Finland. And um, based on, you know, on the institute, on your work over there, uh, what would be, like even from the institute itself, what would be the kind of like the example, practical examples by which people can improve their mental well-being? Um. I have to think a tiny bit because uh, what me what Mieli does is uh, mental health promotion and awareness, and as a part of that, um, we have different posters designed uh, in the topic. And there are two two posters coming up in my mind, and I was just thinking uh, which one to mention, but maybe I will go um, with one, which which is called the Hand of Mental Health, where it has uh, like five different um, aspects how you can what you can do and like in the everyday to improve your mental health and that is uh, like physical exercise which we are pretty much covering and then eating which again we pretty much covering and then there are sleeping uh, which I'm not sure if we will be mentioned but it's just a really important part of from physical aspect and then it's really interesting again just to connect that when we are talking about mental health, actually three, uh, three out of the five is connected to physical health. So of course you have to be fine first. And then the second, like the other two is like uh, social relationships and creativity. And then with creativity, we come back to again, the same thing that like to, to be able to grow, to, to be curious, that's, that's one thing. And then, you know, to, create something and that the, it of course can be like literally uh, painting or dancing or reading or writing or whatever but it also can be you know like everyday things at home like cooking a nice meal for example or like at work having a meaning 
And then social relationships, I think I don't have to explain it a lot, but it, I would like to put a big emphasis on that because I think mainly in Finland, um, like people tend to be a bit more distant or at least that's my understanding so far. And so like, Humans are social creatures and it has like the sense of belonging somewhere is a very important need of ours and like having good social relationships and when I talk about social good social relationships I'm not talking about how many likes we get on Facebook or on, on other social media but like do I have a person who I can share my day with, you know, that, hey, I had a really good day, I had a small success at work, or hey, I had a really bad day because I missed the bus, like, I, I got soaked somewhere and then even my boss was mean with me, and like, so can we share these small moments of life with someone, like, truly? Can we say to someone that, hey, I would need a bit of help, can I call you because, you know, I just don't feel like it. So I think those things, and I would add a sixth, which is just take your time for yourself, because I think it's not that obvious, mainly when you are a really busy person with work or with family or with whatever, that like take a moment when just you are with yourself and you can connect how you, with how you feel and like um, be in silence and, and just not to do anything for anyone but for yourself. So those little moments in the everyday life are also very important. Thank you very much for your response. Um, I remember that, uh, just before, that maybe I, actually I can't tell specifically how many years ago, but I remember that there used to be a study uh, that was based on different, uh, they use uh, different uh, uh, method to come up with the title of the happiest nation in the world. And I remember Nigeria won it. And I was like, wow, this is very interesting. You know, being in Nigeria is such a good feeling that Nigeria was known as the, you know, world happiest uh, country before Finland, uh, uh, before this uh, uh, different kinds of research were carried out. But uh, the point that I wanted to raise there is the, uh, the, 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 the outcome, the things that they analyze and they find out that, that uh, social connection, social interaction is very, very important to our uh, overall well-being, but also it promotes happiness from within. And one thing they mentioned at which you also stressed here is that, uh, that in Nigeria, that uh, people share their problem with everyone around, that, you know, even when you don't have, and that's the interesting key part which I actually wanted to bring uh, forth here is that even when you don't have, you don't worry that you don't have because anyone around you who have, you will be willing to go and ask and he will be willing to share with you. So sometimes um, those of us, I mean us who come from a country like that and of course those of us who have been born and uh, raised here, we sometimes take, you know, we find too much indulgence in this uh, hard form of individuality that, you know, we don't even dare to ask for help. You know, to ask for help is actually, uh, it's, it's, it's a generous request because only when you are able to ask for help is also when you can be open to giving because if you sit down alone and you say, I can do it all by myself, when somebody comes to ask for you, start to look, why are you disturbing me? Like, you know, why can't you just do this yourself? So um, it's very interesting, and I really uh, appreciate that uh, contribution. But, and, you know, you talk about exercise, which is also interesting, and I will quickly dash this to Kingsley. Uh, <laughs> what would you say about, you know, exercise, you know, having impact or affecting uh, mental health? Well, it's a great deal because, you know, when we move, when we interact, like she said, Esther mentioned, the social aspect of things, we're human beings, we're social animals, we want to interact, we want to engage. So um, exercise is our physical um, or mental well-being is just, um, it's more than, again, lifting weights and doing drills. You know, there's so many elements, there's so many things that goes into that. So social activity, the, the kind of, uh, you know, um, emotional sort of reaction that is that you respond to, 
the things that is around you, all these things, you know, contribute to how you feel mentally and uh, how you feel in over, overall uh, well-being. So um, I think it's um, crucially important for us to uh, know that um, the social aspect of uh, well-being is, is very, very important. Of course, um, if you think about fitness, when you do like train alone, um, there is also some certain level of energy you maintain at that zone. And then when you are training or doing something with people, not just the training, right? Um, there are also some certain level of mental, I mean, uh, um, sort of energy frequency that, that you attain during those processes. I remember when I was training in, um, in the UK, and then of course the group of people that I train, um, they are mainly women, uh, young mothers, you know, um, of course people from different backgrounds and stuff like that. The energy that I receive from them also is, diff is quite different from how it is, you know, if I'm just maybe training, all training one on one here or, or you know, or we are in group or probably maybe me and Everest is training. So all these different, you know, little, little element of, of beat and beat and beat is actually make up the whole big picture of how we feel about ourselves mentally and physically. Thank you very much. Um, I just, uh, some maybe weeks ago, I listened to a TED talk where a neuro, uh, neuroscientist, as they are called, who research so much about brain waves and brain activities. And uh, they try to research the impact of physical exercise on the brain. And what they found out was that actually physical exercise is one of the most transformative uh, uh, thing that affects the brain. And the area of the brain that it affects is that areas that uh, help us to feel enjoyment, to feel happy. So um, when I just looked at it, then I also looked back that uh, uh, personally myself, when I have been, you know, sometimes low, exercise helped me, it, it, it kind of like helped me to escape that low mood. But one other thing I would like to actually add to this is the importance of training together with people because uh, when you are in a group doing a particular exercise, there is one thing, at least for me, I don't know about all of you, but I, I know one thing that I am motivated when I see that there is somebody there, you know, he seems to be doing way better and I, I can I fail myself and not like, you know, push myself hard as, he, as him or her, you know? So that kind of, even this interaction happens individually in my head, but it motivates me to do better. It motivates me to take that extra effort. So, you know, bringing that social element into exercise is something that is very, very impactful, but it also creates that feeling of belonging. And then just to add a little bit to that is that uh, I like the nature a lot. And most people who know me very well, they, they know that I, I spend a lot of time in the nature. And one thing that I found is that, uh, I mean, in response to mental well-being, is that when I go to the nature and I'm in the forest or in a place where there's a lot of body of water, like coastal environment, it does help me to organize my thoughts better and get better clarity. But more so, it gives me a different move, mood, like it kind of like it enhances what I call the attention capability of myself. That when somebody has talked to me, I'm able to give you know, full attention when I come back from there. So uh, quickly, uh, I know uh, I don't have so much time here, uh, but I just uh, wanted to um, kind of like go back to the mental aspect of well-being. And I will throw a question to Esther. Unfortunately, <laughs> I've been coming to you quite often. <laughs> um, for example, uh, if I have, let's say, depression, I hope I won't. <laughs> let's say I have a depression. How do I go about seeking help? Where can I go seek help? For example, uh, here in Finland. Um, yes. So there are many ways. And the first one, which 
is maybe not the easiest one, but it can also be a good step, is like you can go to the Tervez Kaskus and book an appointment and then you can talk there with a nurse. And uh, if you get approved for uh, psychological therapy, you c the Kela can actually support your therapy with some, uh, some amount. Um, and then they can also assign you a psychotherapist or a psychologist. Um, but I must say that unfortunately at the moment this process is very lengthy because first you talk with a nurse, then you talk with someone else, and then if it's not a crisis, then you wait a lot, and then you have some checkups, and then if you don't ha have Kela, then of course it's very expensive. If you have Kela, it still costs some money, and then, so it's, it's not easy, but I would say that that's, I would try that first because, first of all, if you are cri in crisis, the process will be way faster. Um, so they really prioritize those cases and then you can get help fast. If you are not in crisis, then yes, the process is lengthy, but theoretically you can wait for it. Um, so it's not ideal, but this is one way. And then uh, Mieli has actually a crisis phone line, which you can call and also there is an SOS center which means that they can, until you are waiting for example for your for your um, Tervez Cascus to get in the system properly, you can get up to five se sessions for free with a professional. This is called uh, also crisis help or crisis center or whatever, but what is crisis is defined by you. And I think this is not a very fortunate name because then you feel, oh, am I in crisis? It's a bit scary and then, okay, but I, I can get out of bed so it's not that bad or something. But actually merely doesn't define crisis, you can define. So if you are in a divorce and you are feeling bad, you just lost your job, you, I don't know, had a fight with your spouse or you don't know how to go on, it also can be a crisis. So like with any kind of question, you can actually contact them and then they can at least direct you further. And what I would also mention is that for me, at least, it works that you can contact someone maybe from your home country and have online help. Because sometimes, uh, like, having therapy or having help on your own language can actually be very beneficial. Though I would say that if you have really depression and maybe you have, you, or any kind of problem that might need hospitalization or medica medication or something, of course, online therapy from your own country won't be able to do that. So you do that when like, you feel that that alone will help. If you feel it's not alone, it will help, then you definitely go through the Finnish system, I would say. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> it's not easy then to uh, seek help with uh, those kind of explanations, but uh, somehow uh, one have to seek help. Um, yes, Sorry, just one more thing came up in my mind that actually the psychologists, the foreign psychologists are forming uh, an RU and they are trying to bring their, um, their services closer to those who are not native Finns because native, native help is, is an important question. So there are things moving on in the question, but yeah, unfortunately, there is still a lot to work on. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, I know uh, we're kind of, uh, the clock is ticking very fast, but I thought I'd quickly kind of uh, ask this one more question to kind of like bring the conversation a bit more closer together. And uh, it's a nutritionist question. Uh, is there a way that we can eat certain food that, we, that will make us feel better mentally? Well, um Yes uh, and no. I mean, there is no specific food which will make you feel better mentally. But I think that uh, all the things in nutrition-wise, uh, what we have been covering, are kind of bringing you to that state. Because if you feed good food to your body, what also Kingsley said was that you will feel it. And when your body feels good, I mean, your body is also your brain. And uh, that's where all these mental problems also come from. So if you feed good, uh, nutrient-dense foods 
to your body, then you will also feel better. No, so basically I would say that um, all the like real foods, whole foods, cook at home, know what you're eating and really pay attention to that. Also, uh, I would like to add the social aspect. So eat with people, eat with people you like and um, go out or maybe you can cook together even better because then you would also know exactly what you're eating. That's very interesting. Thank you very much. Uh, I think I actually like that cooking together because uh, I think cooking together bring a uh, social element into food. And then also, even when you share it and eat together, it does actually uh, promote your well-being, at least if not for the long run, for that uh, immediate moment, there should be a positive impact. But um, uh, I want to thank all of you, starting from uh, Kingsley, Ify, and then Esther, uh, Ella, and Jasmine. Please uh, give a round of uh, a big, oh, sorry, not yet, I forgot. <laughs> I said I would throw a moment for the audience to ask questions, and I almost forgot. I'm so sorry about that. Uh, before we round up, uh, uh, quickly, I turn to the audience, and uh, this is your turn uh, to throw in one or two questions. Yes. I would take uh, him first and then you next. Belt. Not necessarily. There are certain foods which are not digested. Basically, when we're coming to fiber, for instance, there is that insoluble fiber. And when we're thinking about insoluble fiber, like there are no calories. Of course, there are some calories, but the body does not use them. So what's the job of uh, insoluble fiber is to help with this bowel movement. So you will notice that the more fiber you eat, the more to the toilet you will go, basically. So I think that's... Um, that's not an indication that you're eating too much, um, but you're eating foods which are, the body is not uh, able to digest. But of course, if these are not like, let's say, uh, fibrous foods, then uh, it might be, there might be an issue with the digestion of your, uh, of your bowel. All right, thank you very much. Yes. Maybe I start first, make it quick and fast. <laughs> so there is five pillars to my own approach, which I will recommend to you, which includes, first of all, the, um, the diet, the sleep, which is, you know, is incredibly important. The psychology, I mean, the, the social aspect of thing that we're talking, we're covering a lot also. And then uh, the, so there's also spiritual aspect to this where like, you know, the, the kind of things that you can relate to, that whether it is meditation, whether it is praying, you know, it, it's also important. But more than any other thing, the psychological aspect of thing, because I say psychology because um, if you love yourself, right, you treat it as such. Um, it's so important and that's the area that i truly focus all my activities if you look at people that have been in sports for let's say very um, active participant of sports um, as soon as they, they end their career you know give them just one two years you see them you will recognize them so but there are different aspects of things that you can tap into um, that will keep you not just physically fit but psychologically, um, you can actually make it an attitude or a, a way of life that will sustain you over a, a long period of time. 
You look at uh, someone like Zinedine Zidane, for an example. This guy, he performed at a very, very elite level. Um, he still fit. He, you know, he trains still with a uh, with the group that he, with the team that he 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 manages. I mean, psychology, the psychological aspect of thing is just everything. So um, just remember that you need to treat yourself right. And once you treat your body right, and once you're conscious of that, that also will just guide the rest of the things that you will engage in. Whether it is the kind of food you are going to eat, whether it is the friends, which is the social aspect, the friends that you have around you, because those, all those kind of things count. If you are, for example, if you have a partner or you have a friend that, you know, they're drinking beer every time or it's a habit for them, there is chance that you might be doing that. Or if you're just the one that is being active, trying to live a clean life and all that kind of thing, they might sway you to, you know, do what they are doing. So the psychological aspect is so important. And the, 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 um, the people that I try to train, uh, when they come to me, for example, and say you want to, they want to build muscle and stuff like that, uh, even, even when there is money there, I'm not really interested. Of course, I know I can make money. There was one um, case where, you know, someone was talking to me, you know, a client, obviously, and I was telling to Ella, because he wants to build muscle, but I'm not in that sort of, it doesn't mean that I don't, you know, do weight training, but I said, Ella, can you take care of this client? Because my, it's a different approach. So the psychology of pain and knowing why you're doing it, because once you commit, right, everyone has the desire to do something better, to live better, to have better physique, to have good body and all that kind of thing. But not a lot of people have what it takes to go beyond and the willpower to actually keep and maintain that process. So if that makes sense. Um, I will just quickly add, you asked about the routines. Um, just do more than nothing. I mean, even one single routine, um, for instance, eating one fruit instead of zero, like usually people think that, you know, eating, uh, I'm not eating healthy, but living healthy is very difficult. It actually is not. But when you start, you have a lot of things which you should maybe change. Don't think about changing them all like this, because what we want, we want lifestyle changes. We want changes which carry on until you literally die. Um, so if you're starting from not doing uh, many th good things to yourself, start with one good thing. And when you do one good thing, even a week after a year, you have 52 good things. So you want to respond? Or? Yes, sorry. What was the question in this direction? <laughs> Um, well, I think when it comes to uh, how, how to build a better mental health, I think it starts with connecting with yourself and uh, like not being afraid of asking questions and answering those questions. Because I think many people are not asking crucial questions because they are afraid of might they find out as an answer. So I think it starts then, they're like, I dare to be quiet. I dare to go to the toilet without my phone. I dare to fall asleep without the TV. But I dare to do be in quiet and ask questions from myself. And when I find something scary, it's completely fine. You you can have people around you to share it with. Uh, hey, oh my God, I just thought, I, I, I think I think this or did this or like, am I like this? And then, you know, your friends or your family can be, for example, a good sanity check. If you some, find something, or you can ask them, that, hey, what do you think? Am I like this or that? Like, um, actually, my partner can just uh, tell that sometimes I'm just laying in bed, and I ask at 10 p.m. maybe from him, that, hey, what do you think? What kind of person I am? And he was like, he is really a tough guy, so he answered the question. But like, <laughs> so I think your family around and friends can really help you out that, and they can also be there if you find something that you don't like, because we all have something. Of course, I also had some stuff that I, 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 I was not. So I think there, and of course, if you feel like, then you can also go to a professional to help you further. But that I think I would start somewhere there. 
Thank you very much for that response. Um, yes. If, if I may answer the question, I will try to be quick because I, I know we are running out of time. But first of all, I would like to say big respect for doing the work you are doing because it's really a beautiful and a super hard one. Um, and to be very honest, I'm not the right person to answer your question because I left psychological therapy because of that. I was working with homeless people and I didn't figure out the answer myself. Um, but what I could say that I think, for example, rituals can maybe help. So if you have a ritual before you go to work or after you come to work, you always do somehow the same, maybe even physical thing or mental or whatever works for you, just to transit. Like we learn, for example, during COVID that uh, working from home, it makes it so much um, healthier if you change your clothes even when you are working from home and then you change back after your work day to your home clothes and just that small ritual can really make a difference between so maybe something like that not changing clothes but something could work um, and definitely if you don't get enough support because exactly supervision is there for you to get support and if you don't get enough support you should definitely seek more because that's a super hard work you are doing and you should be able to to process that somewhere and get the professional support that you you should so I think the, the ritual and the, the supervision more supervision from professional side would would um, be my answer and to the other question of toxic people so I'm listening this podcast from an Australian psychologist um, let's talk about mental health uh, by the way I can recommend it for any about anyone and when it, um, he was talking about relationships I really liked his approach he said that when and it can be whatever relationship that like you should always work on, your, uh, on the relationship. You should not just quit, but you should figure out, you know, how to, how, to, um, how to understand each other better and how to challenge each other and how to accept each other even when it's hard, except if it's abusing mentally, physically, emotionally. Then you get out without question. And 
I'm not really sure what kind of relationship what you're talking about, but I think that's a really good. So if it's not abusing, then it's, you can, for example, go to family therapy in some way, and then you can get help or you can just try on your own. But you, if you ever feel that it's crossing a line in any way, even if it's not physical, then it's, it's just definitely an out. Yes. Yes, thank you very much. I very much agree yeah. with your comment. Thank you very much uh, for your comments. Um, uh, just before I run this session up, um, uh, there is something that I personally uh, practice, which I call awareness. And awareness uh, in practice for me means that uh, I take one step out to see better one step backward to see better. And in terms of uh, either in, the, in relationship or psychological or kind of a mental, emotional struggles, it means that my interpretations or what I call knowledge or whatever it is that I know are different impressions, informations that I have gathered all over this time that I've been at least alive. And I use them to make a, re, a kind of a to, to, to interpret the reality that I am in. And these impressions that I have gathered is not me. Just like, for example, uh, we eat and eat and we gather the body that we have. And sometimes we think that when we say, I am Everest, we get stuck that this body is the Everest. Uh, what I mean in practice by that, it means that when you are able to take a step backward and you look at what you call yourself, you will start to see, you will get more clarity to how you see yourself, how you define yourself. Because that awareness is what eventually kind of like gives you uh, what I would call maybe the energy to, uh, to do what is necessary, either to put a full stop to something that is not coming the way you want, or either to actually take a bold step forward. Uh, but to round this session up, um, you've all heard the discussion from the panelists, uh, and I want to, first of all, kind of like relate the discussion from the perspective that uh, when you think about physical fitness, going to the gym, running, taking a walk around in the park, it's a kind of an investment that eventually come to give you clarity and have control over your mental sanity. When you engage with social, uh, uh, when you socialize with people, friends, families, love someone, let someone love you, take from someone and be willing to give to others, it's an exercise. It might be subtle in, 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 its, in its own, uh, uh, in, the, in the manner in which you carry it, carry it out, but it contributes to your, you know, well-being. It is also the part of the thing that you do to kind of create what I call the well-being lifestyle. And then when you start to come around and you eat, you know, one thing that I like about food is that you have a body that is going to digest that food. And I can tell you, every time you drop something in your mouth and you eat it and it goes down into your digestive tract, your body deals with it and the result you will get. And the result can come in a physical shape. The result can also come in a mental shape because, for example, when people uh, 
eat certain kind of food and they start to feel that this food uh, is not really a healthy food. They have a self-judgment for themselves that, ah, I'm doing the wrong thing. But then that admission, that awareness that I'm doing the wrong thing is one vital step to actually trying to better what you eat. And um, all of this discussion brings us, you know, when you put them together, it gives us the notion from, you know, looking at well-being, looking at our health from a different angles where we can say, yes, we can do this. We can manage our food. We can decide what we put in our mouth. We can decide what is in the plate. And then we can take a step to engage in activities. We can clear our head of stress and just be willing to enjoy life and kind of revigorate our ability to also enjoy, you know, every day that we are experiencing, which we call life. So I would like to thank my uh, panelists, Kingsley, for coming to participate in this session, and also Esther for your lovely contributions, and then Ella and uh, Jasmine for actually coming at a very kind of um, uh, die minute to take this uh, uh, to take the stage. Uh, I really appreciate your contribution, and I know I can't thank you enough, but uh, I would say thank you very much. Please, a big hand of applause. Thank you. Thanks. Uh,